Well, let's look at Chapter 11, How is Technology Changing Education? And as you know, this is uh, technology is pretty near and dear to me because the things that I've been able to do in my life with it, and I, I get pretty excited about it, but I want to know truth also. I want to know the effect. I want to know what other people say about it because I know not everybody shares my attitude about technology. And, of course, the bigger thing, I think, for the most part in our schools and with you is the cost, the additional cost it, it takes and so that's what this is about. Let's take a look at this. First of all, just a little introduction to the chapter. School planners developing uh, new schools and creating classrooms very different from the static four walls of the typical classroom. And you think of how we've expanded the classroom with the use of, uh, of technology. Uh, changes in technology have led to dramatic changes in instructional resources as well as building materials that allow individuals to rethink the entire educational experience. And certainly changes, uh, dramatic changes in educational uh, means also, not just the resources. And this is from your textbook. This is just a little layout of how the chapter is going to be uh, played. Um, it, it talks about this, but this is interesting also is, um, you know, what, what others say in, uh, about it. Uh, the real life experiences, uh, you know, course offerings and stuff, uh, some of those uh, uh, real things. Um, uh, and this, this part is interesting too, the distractors uh, from this uh, process. Well, here's some focus questions. What technology competency standards have been recommended for learners and teachers? And the text talks about this whole group, this whole network, this whole organization, the ISTE standards. When we started using so much technology, we felt We've got to have some type of a standard that we're teach to, that people know what to teach. Why do changes associated with modifications in technology depend both on the nature of the new technologies and the force of the tradition? And how does uh, today's digital communication technology help learners learn? And I wonder if any of us can answer that. Uh, you know, does it help you learn? And which challenges have accompanied the introduction of new technology into school? And you certainly could name uh, some of those challenges right now. And which federal laws seek to shield learners from dangers that might result from introductions of new technology in the school? So it's interesting that even at the federal level, uh, this has become, uh, you know, uh, come under scrutiny. Well, what can we do with it? Well, computers uh, link us to that World Wide Web, hence that uh, at the beginning of any website has that www in the front of it. That stands for the World Wide Web. And so uh, we're starting to consider this in our culture, that connection to the World Wide Web is a standard utility in your house, such as water, electricity, gas, sewer. And, it, you know, now a lot of people, and I'm one, would consider uh, a, a connection uh, part of those utilities that it would just be a standard. Okay, so if you participate in the virtual archaeology dig in cooperation with learners from the school, and so you are going on exploration uh, using this. Engaging in a video conference with learners in, each, in schools in other parts of the country, and I don't hear as much of this, but I used to hear a lot of this, uh, in the schools is that you know we're, we're connecting with another classroom someplace a different part of the world and that was very interesting to, to uh, really remove boundaries from kids and then organizing multimedia presentations using video clips music audio clips to contrast some differences in the lives of young people growing up in urban part of the United Kingdom such as London and then rural sections of the uh, Shetland uh, Islands are also preparing to a recordable CD using an un on important issues facing the state that will feature a selectable digital camera pictures taken during a field trip to the state capitol to meet with legislative leaders, information gathered by using persons, personal digital assistance to connect the internet websites featuring the state laws, and learners' own verbal comments. And so we can now create learning not only with a pen or by writing, but you know audibly, which is, was unheard of uh, a very short time ago. How about this? Using a computer to write an article titled Life in the World War I Trenches based on information assessed access from libraries. 
and other internet sites from email and perhaps video phone exchanges with directors of museums around the world and other collections focusing on World War I. Okay. And so isn't that interesting too that uh, in some of you this, this is a really interesting phenomena that we would you know, uh, go on this archaeological dig on World War I where we'd contact libraries or even museums uh, that have expertise in the field. That's what the technology allows us to do. Well, what's the technology behavior? Well, technology has a constraining force. What is that? Well, uh, technological changes have raised the limits of what's possible in our classrooms, obviously, even in our classroom uh, for this class. But the Internet gives learners the opportunity to gather information from sources much wider, okay, much wider and more diverse than the traditional books and teacher presentations. And another thing, it allows uh, additional uh, before, it was only uh, the only source we had is a textbook. Where now there's unlimited amounts of, of sources for information on different topics. And of course, as you're well aware in the WWW, you can't not hardly imagine a topic that there hasn't been something written about it on the WWW. Well, how about existing practices as constraining force as well? well? What do you think here? What are some current traditions? Uh, or practices in education that interfere with the application of technology? And what are some examples of ways that new technologies serve as detractors in, uh, to educational progress? Stop the video, stop the recording now, and go to your notes and respond to these two uh, things, the current traditions and examples, and then come back. This is straight out of the textbook on page 289, some of the constraints. Uh, think of this. There's a development of a large and sophisticated textbook in educational materials industry that has huge inventories to, of products designed to use over this 9 to 10 month school year. This is why what we have against year-round school on page 289. So here's one reason why we don't have year-round school. Here's another one. Assumptions by parents and guardians that children will be free to go on family vacations. Okay, some of you agree with that during the summer months, but you know, how do the people that are not, do not have kids in school, how do they vacation? Well, it would be the same way with this. If your family wanted to go on vacation, you'd make arrangements with school just like you would at work. Here's another one. School district schedules presume that painting, repair work, and other activities associated with building maintenance will occur during the summer months when buildings are vacant. But again, I ask you, how do they do these same types of things in other industries, in hospitals, nursing homes, where there's people there all the time? Well, you just create some kind of a schedule for these regular maintenance things. It's kind of an old uh, euphemism that it has to be done this summer. Here's another thing from your textbook, why we don't have year-round schools. College and university budgets that assume that large numbers of teachers will pay tuition and attend classes during the summer. That's very traditional. But now with our online world, there's no reason that this can't happen year-round. There's no real reason to hold that up for summer. And the last one, again, these are out of your textbook, page 289. I encourage you to take a look at it. Summer program offered by school districts to assist learners who need to retake courses to receive other kinds of help if they are to keep up with others in their group with regular school classes begin in the fall. And so what they're suggesting here is uh, that infamous summer school. What would happen to summer school if we had year-round schools? You see how archaic some of these things are? Well, this is making a case for technology, the technology supporting each one of these archaic reasons why we don't have year-round school. So here's some, some promises of new school, of new technologies. Your technology allows learner to gain information from many sources through that www. including web-based instruction from a teacher located hundreds of miles away from the learner's location. In the future, more learners will receive instruction at home or in a number of other settings. Um, and I think that will be interesting to see how that plays out, that if we start to allow high school people, middle school people, to learn away from where the teacher is. Technology gives teachers the ability to function more as an instructional guide than as a primary source of information. In the future, teachers may spend more time diagnosing individuals lear individual learners' needs 
and helping develop programs of study that use technology appropriate for their own learning styles. And so we'll direct, as we talked about some of the things in this course, having the student more responsible for the learning. New technology relieve the need for school days and time to be organized so rigidly. What are those times? Ooh, we need five days a week and we need to be there for eight hours a day. In the future, teachers may find their students spend more time at home or in community centers where computers are available and engage in considerable self-guided learning. Okay. I wonder what this would do with classroom management problems, behavior problems, if kids could work at their own pace in their own settings. I don't know. Maybe they wouldn't get anything done. It'd be an interesting experiment. Again, this is out of your textbook dealing with this. And if you just allow me to read this from page 292. However, it may be that many students do not want to learn at home. They want the human contact and the ability to discuss ideas with others. Although students may voice displeasure about going to school, many of them prefer that social atmosphere of school over that at home. Just because individuals can learn independently, does not mean they will choose to do so. And that's what I see on the college campus. We talk about this all the time. What will happen uh, to the college campus if we have this continual rapid movement towards online learning? Well, my opinion, you didn't ask for it, but I'm giving you my opinion, is that there will always be a demand for the college experience. People wanting to move at that point in their life where they want to go move and live in similar in groupings with you know people with like-mindedness and go through this learning process yes they may learn online but they'll still need that 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 change today teachers are using digital communication technology for many purposes including one reteaching and reinforcing content two providing enrichment experiences for talented learners and so we call it the gifted Three, individualizing the assignments really allows for what we call differential uh, uh, teaching where one student needs one level of assignment or learning, another one needs a different level, so we can have that differentiated for the different learners in that same level. And number four, promoting global perspectives, again using that W, 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 encouraging international email, pen pals, etc. And five, at desktop publishing, letting uh, let's briefly turn our attention to several more complete descriptions of the other present-day applications of new communication technologies. Here are those examples: developing uh, learners' research capabilities, more course offerings, provide services for underperforming schools, simulating real-life experiences, helping learners with special problems. I saw a demonstration uh, at the conference about uh, this real life experience, how they dissected a frog virtually. Okay, all you queasy people that don't want to cut into a frog, uh, now you can do it virtually and basically have the exact same process. What are some challenges? Educational policy, especially Larry Cuban, and Larry's a Larry's a big name in, in technology, notes that attempts to install innovations in schools have featured a cycle including these phases, phases of challenges. First, an overblown description of potential benefits phase during which public claims about how the technology will transform education are made. Okay, and I can I lived through this phase uh, here at DSU that it it's won't you know won't have the effect on learning uh, that we think it will. Well, here's the next phase: disappointing research results phase, during which reports emerge showing that the innovation has produced fewer beneficial results than its promoted motors and had promised. The third phase. Investigate cause for failure phase during which the future investigation reveals, the further investigation reveals that the relatively few teachers have implemented the innovation or they have been uh, implemented in its ways that deviate from that basic design. And so this cycle is, this stage, they're not using it or they're not using it correctly. Then fourth, place the blame phase which teacher features criticism of teachers who sometimes are described as human barriers to of technology would do wonderful things for young people. Okay, then we have these barriers. So what do you think? How comfortable are you with using technology in your classroom? And what are your personal concerns about using technology as a teaching tool? Again, stop this recording. 
go to your notes and respond to these two questions and then come back and start the recording again. Now I want you to go find the link for the video uh, on caught cheating using cell phones and watch the video and then respond to these three questions. And if you want, don't come back here, they're on page 301 in your textbook. Stop this recording, go watch this, then come back. Let's talk about the more than one more controversial things in technology, and that is known as the digital divide. Have you ever heard that term, the digital divide? The digital divide has been coined to describe the disparity that exists when high percentage of people in one category use them and high percentage of people in another cat categories do not. Okay, what are those categories? Well, for the most part, we claim it's the difference between the haves and the have-nots. The people that have, as, you know, are fluent middle class people, have technology in their homes as part of their utilities, like I talked about earlier. The have nots tend to be more that lower class of people who are struggling with life itself, do not have access, and hence this digital divide gets wider. Okay? So I need you to be familiar with this term, digital divide, is one of the things. And then a summary. I want you to stop this again and go back to your notes and respond to these things. When did you first encounter a computer? How did you feel? Was it for learning or for playing a game? And how much formal computer training have you had to date? And what is your skill level? Rate yourself. And I'll give you a Liker scale. One, two, three, four, or five. And this being high and one being low. That concludes the lecture on Chapter 11, Technology. Mm -hmm.